we start a discussion on an issue making headlines. The COVID-19 pandemic has frozen air travel for many, many countries across the world. A UN aviation agency predicts that by the end of 2020, 71% of seat capacity and some 1.5 billion passengers could be lost. Airlines and airports could lose up to $314 billion and $100 billion respectively. And for 2020, as travel restrictions continue and people remain hesitant about traveling, the industry is expected to continue hemorrhaging money. This would compromise its ability to stay afloat and continue supporting millions of people around the world who rely on the aviation business. With the pandemic continuing to rage on, can the, this industry survive the crisis? For this, we discuss the issue with Ian Lee, Associate Professor of Carlton University's Sports School of Business, and Yang jun Sok, Professor of Economics at Catholic, the Catholic University of Korea. My first question to you, Dr. Lee. So how big has the impact been so far? I mean, around five months into the crisis, the IATA did identify some priority countries that need to be, take action. Which countries do you think are going to be the hardest hit? Uh, so, Young, first off, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I very much appreciate. I've been to your beautiful country. And of course, you were at the forefront in uh, the successful uh, fight against the COVID crisis, which has been so devastating, and especially, especially so to the airline industry. It is just being brutal. I mean, I, there's a brand new report that was published, is very fresh, published in the last 48 hours from IATA, suggesting, showing, documenting, uh, seat capacity has been is declined by 50 percent. Revenues are down by 50 to 60 percent. It's just been absolutely uh, devastating to every airline around the world. And they broke it down re uh, regionally, meaning Asia Pacific, Europe, and North America. And uh, Asia Pacific has uh, suffered the worst. They're down 48 percent. This is passenger revenues, and uh, Europe is down 30 percent and uh, North America is down 28%. But regardless, these are just staggering uh, reductions in an industry that has never been a, an extremely profitable industry. I mean, for many, many years, it, it, it lost money. Warren Buffett famously said somebody should have shot the guy that flew the first airplane in 1906 in the United States, and he would have saved the airline industry billions of losses over the following century. They finally were making money, and then along came this COVID crisis in a capital-intensive industry, brutally competitive, profit margins small, and now their revenues are collapsing. Well, you just mentioned that these uh, companies, these airline businesses, they were already losing money. And well, my question to you, Dr. Yang, is that well, South Korean Airlines, they, they were also facing very harsh financial difficulties before the pandemic broke out. And now they've reached the point of asking cabin crew to take up to a year's leave. And they're even considering selling some of their, fleet of, uh, their fleets of planes to stay afloat. Just how much trouble are they in? Okay, well, for Korea in the second quarter, international flights out of Incheon fell by 85%. Uh, passengers fell by 98%. Uh, last year, same time, second quarter, uh, the international pa uh, passengers were 17.5 million, but this year it's only 291,000. Uh, Korean Air, it's operating only 28 out of its 110 international routes. Asiana is operating only 22 out of its 72 international routes. Uh, second quarter losses are estimated to be for Korean Air, 43 billion won. Uh, Asiana, uh, it's estimated to be 238.5 billion won. Uh, now, Asiana and Korean Air, they're not only passenger airlines, they're also a freight airline. So they're expected to at least be able to survive from the uh, freight income. Uh, but we also have some low cost carriers. Uh, a lot of them will be very hard hit. Uh, for example, the uh, the uh, Jeju airline has lost 65.7 billion won. So all these Korean airlines just making a lot of a lot of losses and more losses expected to come down the road. Well, Dr. Yang, Asiana Airlines, it's embroiled in a takeover crisis right now due to its snowballing debt. Just how critical, though, is this takeover for the company's survival? Okay, well, the Asiana Airlines used to belong to the uh, Kumo uh, group, uh, and it's 
a uh, lot of people think that uh, Asiana played a major role in actually bringing the Kumo group down. Uh, it's a combination of losses from Asiana as well as uh, overexpansion by the uh, management of the Kumo group. But still, uh, the Asiana and Hyundai Development Company were uh, in discussion for uh, Hyundai to buy uh, Asiana Airlines, but Right now, HDC, the Hyundai Development Company, seems to be getting cold feet. Now, uh, it's not entirely clear whether they're doing this as a negotiation ploy to bring down uh, the uh, purchase price or whether they are indeed serious about uh, not no longer purchasing the Asiana Airlines. But we also have another case of mergers uh, between the Agion Group, which owns Jeju Air, and uh, E-Star. Uh, airlines, which uh, are two smaller airlines here, and that merger is having some problems as well, uh, uh, since uh, Jeju Air, the uh, Agion Group, believes that during the time of this co uh, coronavirus crisis, if they do take over Eastar Air, uh, that may be causing so much of a cash uh, outlay problem that it may actually bring down the Agion Group. Uh, so they're having second thoughts on that merger as well. So really uncertainty all around for these airline businesses. Dr. Lee, Europe is starting to reopen its borders, allowing passengers from certain countries to come in. Do you think this will be enough to give a, a bit of a boost to the uh, ailing airline industry? And do you think resuming flights is the answer right now? Um, I'll do your second, answer your second question first, Suyan. Uh, absolutely. The, these, the, the airlines need cash flow. This industry is very capital intensive. Those planes are not cheap, you know, those big Boeing planes and Airbus planes. And it, it's not just the cost of the plane. I mean, fuel, we think of fuel as a variable cost. You know, you stop flying, your, your cost goes down. And yet, once you fly the plane, in other words, whether you've got one passenger on that plane or 200 passengers flying from a flight on from Seoul to San Francisco, you've still got to cover your fuel costs. What does that mean? It means you've got to fly and fill that plane as much as possible. And, and as I've said, their cash flow has collapsed. So yes, it's a start in the right direction, opening up some of the uh, countries. It's not going to solve their problem, but it's certainly going to uh, give comfort to investors and bankers who are looking right now at essentially no cash flow or almost no cash flow. So that opening up on a risk-based, country-based basis to allow those countries with great success, such as South Korea, uh, to fly to other countries that have addressed their problems, such as countries in, in Europe, is a very important first step to bringing the economies back and to restoring uh, some health to the airline industry. Well, Dr. Yang, I'd like to hear your opinion on this as well. Just how effective do you think it's going to be to resume flights at this point and lift travel restrictions? Do you think it's going to uh, help in the long run? Uh, it may help in the long run, but I'm not sure if it'll do any help uh, for in the near future. Uh, in general, not just the airline industries, there's usually thought to be three uh, stages of economic recovery from the uh, coronavirus. The first stage is that coronavirus has to be brought under control. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, second, uh, people must uh, be uh, no longer be afraid of going to work, uh, t doing everyday activities, or going abroad in, in an airplane. Uh, and then the third stage is uh, get it, uh, to deal with economic damages from the uh, coronavirus recession. Now, looking at it from that point of view, uh, we, we still don't have coronavirus under control in many countries. But even more important, I think, is that people are, uh, have to feel safe in flying the airplanes, in visiting other countries. I'm not sure if we're at that stage right now, especially in an airplane where it's an enclosed space. And uh, because of the fact that the uh, Dr. Lee just mentioned that the uh, planes has to be filled, uh, it's not a good place to practice distancing. So uh, until people feel safe, even though we opened up, how many tourists we're going to have, I don't think you're going to have much. Well, Dr. Lee, the travel restrictions, they're not just affecting pilots and flight attendants and passengers, but also airport staff, air cargo demand and also catering staff as well. I mean, what kind of support do these massive airline companies need, need uh, from the government or maybe other sources to make it through this crisis? 
I think that's an excellent question, Stu Young, because, of course, we are focused on the airlines, understandably. But these airports on the ground, they're essentially mini cities. Uh, and I'm talking, you know, the big airports of the world in, in your country, in Seoul, in, in, in Heathrow, in San Francisco, in Toronto. They employ thousands and thousands of people. Just very quickly, there's three different, and I'll defer to Dr. Yang in terms of the model of airport governance in Asia, but in, in Canada, the airports were turned into municipal nonprofits. But in Europe, the airports were privatized as private for profit companies, while in the States, the, the bastion of capitalism, you would think they would have privatized, the airports are still owned and operated by the government. Now to your question, uh, the, I know that in, uh, the, in Canada, the subsidies that have been made available to large corporations and nonprofits have been extended to the largest airports in Canada because they employed, as I said, thousands upon thousands of people in all aspects, you know, security, catering, as you said, people in cargo, um, uh, you know, the maintenance of the airports. They're very large uh, little cities uh, within a larger city, and, and they do need help because their revenues have completely collapsed. I mean, they've become ghost towns, these airports, because the planes in those airports where the planes are not flying at all, there's no, they, these people have been laid off. Now, I know that air uh, travel is returning slowly in the States, so it's not completely the case, but it's still been devastating to these um, to the, in the United States, the airports, as I said, are owned by government, so they're already being subsidized by the government. But in Canada and Europe, it's been much more challenging because they don't have this, um, uh, you know, they don't have this reliance of a regular check, if you will, uh, from, the, uh, from the national government. So it's been, they need more help, they need more government support uh, because of the losses they've been incurring in these municipal nonprofit airports and the private for profit airports in Europe. Well, Dr. Yang, South Korea never really sealed its borders, but it's still reeling from the impact of these travel restrictions. How has this impacted the tourism industry here? Okay, well, in March, the Asian Development Bank estimated that if coronavirus lasts six months, Korean tourism industry will lose about $3.1 billion. That's about 3.7 trillion won. Uh, GDP may fall by about 0.2%. Uh, and uh, right now, the coronavirus will, uh, seems like it's going to last longer than six months. Uh, now, uh, most of the tourism agencies in Korea are operating at a loss since the first quarter, and they're surviving basically on government aid. And the, uh, if you look at the March data, that's when the coronavirus really started to uh, have effect on Korea. Foreign tourists coming into Korea fell by 94.8%. Korean tourists going abroad fell by 93.9%. Uh, and uh, then, uh, well, uh, in May, we started to move away from uh, social distancing into what Koreans call everyday distancing, so a uh, less rigid set of rules. Uh, there does seem to be some indication that people are taking advantage of uh, going to tour domestically. They still not, they're still very unsure about going abroad, but they seem to be feeling better about moving, uh, going to uh, tourist spots inside Korea. Uh, but even there, it's not clear whether this uh, rise in uh, domestic tourism is enough to, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not up to the levels that it was before the coronavirus, and it certainly will not replace the foreign uh, tourists who are no longer coming into Korea. Well, Dr. Lee, before we go, as the pandemic stretches on with no end in sight. How long do you expect this recovery to take? Uh, if you mean the airline recovery, um, I'm going. I agree completely with Dr. Yang in the in the sense that you know, if there until there's a a, a successful vaccine, we're not going to return to quote normality. But I want to put a sort of an added twist onto that, and and I've been talking extensively about that in Canada. There is a lot of research going on right now, and apparently the British, the UK government announced a five-minute test. And I have argued and I've talked to airline officials and said, okay, we don't know when the vaccine is going to occur. We all agree, it's, it, everybody's working on it, but nobody knows when it's going to come about or when it's, whether it's going to be successful. However, if they want to get me and other frequent flyers back in that plane, they, what they've got to do in the meantime, and Dr. Yang alluded to that absolutely correctly, people have to feel safe getting on that plane. And I do not believe that the, you know, the 
wiping down the seats and you know restricting the service on the plane is going to convince people like me and I fly a lot they've got to introduce mandatory testing at every airport in the world and any person who wants to fly who does not want to be tested should not be allowed on that plane if they do that and you have a five or a ten minute test and that you, you everybody is tested before they get on the plane that will raise the level of confidence of passengers all around the world uh, yes, there might be the odd person where the test fails and, and reports a false uh, a negative, but I think it will bring passengers back. But we will not see a return to the volumes of pre-COVID until they can, there's either a vaccine or there is mandatory testing that will ensure people uh, that they are going to be safe flying on that silver cigar across the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean for 8, 10, 12, 15 hours without picking up or becoming infected by, by, the, COVID, uh, by the COVID virus. So I think that, that it's, it's not just the vaccine. It, they've got to uh, proceed immediately to immediate fast testing of every passenger at every airport in the world. That will bring, the, I think, the business back. So what you're saying is we can't really just sit and wait around for a vaccine to come. We need to take immediate action to salvage this industry. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to end our discussion here, but it's been wonderful to hear your insights on this. Ian Lee, Professor at Carlton University, and Dr. Yang jun Tok, Professor of Economics at the Catholic University of Korea. Thank you so much for joining us. My Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. This is also where we wrap up the show. Thank you for watching.